showed you. Cool. All right. How you doing? Grab a seat. Welcome to tonight's seminar. Uh, welcome everybody watching online. So tonight we're going to be talking about bugging in and bugging out. And we'll talk about a lot of different stuff all pertaining to that. But before we get into this, completely off the cuff, who remembers what I said was the most important tool you can carry in a kit? I said it as part of my three steps to an effective kit seminar. Who remembers? What's the most important tool I think you could put in a kit? No, actually, physical, something, something tangible. Not, not your mind, your knowledge. Yes, of course. Anybody? <laughs> flashlight. Flashlight. Flashlight is the most important tool. So everybody take the flashlight out you have out of your pocket, out of your purse, and hold it up. Oh, it's in my car. Oh, it's in your car. Okay. We're doing a gear check tonight. How many Pocket flashlights light. do you need? What's that? How many flashlights do you need? Just the one, and not, preferably not the one on, on uh, attached to another tool. <laughs> yeah. So that's that's the big thing, right? I have one on my phone. Flashlight. Most <laughs> important tool you can carry. Always carry a flashlight. Yeah. The one on the phone. So that was a quick little uh, test, if you will, right? Uh, that is the most important tool. It obviously got darker. It gets darker earlier the later in the year until it starts to turn after December 21st, but it's still dark when you go home after dinner, possibly after work. Uh, when we leave here tonight, it's going to be dark in the parking lot. So what I do is I go out, take my flashlight out of my pocket, look to make sure no cretin is hiding around my vehicle, waiting for a spring of surprise attack, right? I'd rather hit somebody with 1,800 lumens and have to apologize for blinding them than try to assume the best and then walk into a dangerous situation. So always carry a flashlight. Always carry a flashlight. Who's got two flashlights on right now? All right, we'll keep going. Three? Uh, okay. Can I count my phone? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Phone counts. Yeah. All right, going up to three. All right, cool. <laughs> All right, so when to bug in or bug out. So tonight, is, it's going to be a, a quicker one, depending upon the discussion we have. And I expect it to take about an hour. We'll talk about some things. First and foremost, we'll do some introductions. Obviously, that's more me-focused. We'll do some critical thinking skills to talk about identifications and introspectives. And then we're going to get into some action items. Action items before, during, and after. And then we'll do a quick summary recap at the end. So with that, introductions. Who am I? My name is Toby. What makes me... Um, certified to stand in front of you tonight and talk about this stuff. Quite frankly, nothing. I've done it for, I would say over a decade at this point, but let's just say the last 10 years, I've been preparedness minded. I've spent a lot of money, I've tried a lot of things, they haven't all worked unfortunately, but if I can share and impart some of those learnings on to you guys, it might save you a couple bucks. And ultimately, a more prepared community as a whole means less of a burden on my shoulders to then try to support all of you. So kudos to you guys for actually showing up tonight, being here, and wanting to be better. As we said all the way back, all the way back, in the very first seminar, this is not just about you or your household. This is about your community. So focus on you and your household. That is obviously number one. But then go beyond that, because if you run out of water or food and your neighbors do, they're going to come to you asking if you've got water or food because you've always been a prepared one. Try to get them involved too, right? Get them, start thinking, hey, maybe buy some things in bulk, do an extra shopping run, store some water, whatever it is. It's a community thing. If you have questions, go ahead and ask them. That's ultimately why we're here. We're here to learn as a community. Yes, I'm the person standing in front of the room talking, but realistically, everybody here can impart knowledge onto all of us because you all have your area of expertise, and I have mine. It's not te you know, teaching or doing anything like that. You might have something that leads directly into a scenario here. Well, hey, I actually, you know, I work for the US, United States Geological Survey. I know a little bit about earthquakes. Let me tell you a little bit about earthquakes, whatever it is. So if you have a question, ask it. If you have a comment, bring those on too. All right, bug in versus bug out. Let's talk about some definitions. First things first, what in the heck does bug out mean? Well, from the Merriam-Webster, it's defined as to retreat during a military action, especially to flee in panic. 
there's two parts to this. First part, to retreat, which means obviously to leave. And the second part is a time element, panic, right? To retreat during a military action, especially in panic, or to flee in panic, which means hastily. So the second one, to depart, especially in a hurry. So there's two things, you're leaving and you're leaving quickly. So when you think bug out, bug out is not an evacuation. An evacuation is different. An evacuation is, hey, there's a hurricane off the coast, we have three days to get the hell out of here. That's an evacuation. A bug out is, there are rioters coming down my street and they're burning every house along the way. You've got maybe minutes to get out in that scenario, right? So two things, to retreat in a panic or to leave in a hurry. Time element, and the leaving element, which brings us to bug in. Well, bug in is not formally defined, but it can be defined as to actively remain in a location during an emergency or during an event or to shelter in place. But notice something, to actively remain. This doesn't mean you just couldn't make up your mind and now you're stuck. That's a completely different thing to decide, to actively decide to remain in a location during an event, whatever that event is, or to shelter in place. Either way, you're making that decision to stay. You're not just all of a sudden stuck. It's also noted that you could do almost like a hybrid of these, right? You might have to, if you're at work, bug out from your work location to bug in at your defined bug in location. My, my decision has been made to actively shelter in place maybe not too far away, but I have to get there first. So there's could be both in a given scenario. Other questions about the definitions or comments about the definitions? All right, so a quick little whiteboard session. First things first, let's talk about some possible scenarios. In my opinion, I believe that every initial scenario can be categorized one of two ways. Violent or nonviolent, but notice I highlighted and bolded and underlined and italic initial. The initial event can be either violent or nonviolent. So that could mean power outage. You know, maybe there was a, a violent event, car hit a pole. That's a violent event. But the power outage is really a nonviolent event. However, subsequent scenarios, compounding events, will almost are very likely to be violent events, which means I am hungry. I am coming to take what you have to feed my family. I will do whatever means necessary to feed my family. That leads to violence, right? So initial events, violent or nonviolent, basically every other compounding event on top of that is likely to be violent. So that's something to think about. So while you might plan for, hey, you know what? I'm not a gun person. I'm not a, I'm not a self-defense minded individual. I'm really only planning for a hurricane. Good. But what happens when your neighbors get hungry? Because you haven't helped them prepare for that scenario or that eventuality. What happens when that happens? What happens when that major metropolitan area decides to all evacuate on the road that you live on? Then what happens? People are going to be scavenging along the way. Compounding events are very likely to be violent. So example, long-term power outage followed by civilian unrest to the point, or civil unrest to the point people begin to loot and fight for resources. So there's your event, there's your example. Power outage, civil unrest, looting and fighting. So review, reviewing and classifying scenarios described in earlier seminars. So here's our whiteboard that we've described a lot of these. Call out some nonviolent uh, scenarios. Just call them out. Hurricane. Hurricane, okay. Arguably nonviolent. What else? Flood. Flood, yeah. Arguably nonviolent. I mean, there's a lot of force there. One could argue a hurricane, a tornado, any kind of mother nature event could be considered a violent event if you're in it. But there could be, let's say, a hurricane, and now we're not dealing with a hurricane, we're dealing with the influx of people. So the event ultimately is nonviolent but the influx of people that we're dealing with, but it might turn violent. What else you got? Contaminated water. Yeah, that's a good one. Um, Tuesday night at my house, turn the taps on to uh, 
give our child a bath, water's brown. Yummy. What the hell's going on, right? So you hop on, you start asking around, you find out that <laughs> the city didn't tell us, but they were doing pipe work right down the road from us, literally right around the corner, just out of the site. They didn't tell anybody, they just showed up and did it. Well, okay, now what? So now we're in the situation of boiling water, or what if a pipe had burst and nobody had known about it and didn't tell the city, or the city couldn't come for two weeks? Then what do you do, right? Nonviolent event. What else? Tornadoes, snow, ice. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I would argue a heart attack, right? Nonviolent event. Utilities outage, nonviolent event. I would probably say the person having the heart attack would argue about that nonviolence part, but realistically, it's like, okay, that event isn't, isn't necessarily a violent one, but the heart attack that leads to an accident, you know, a car crash, an accident, which then leads to a power outage, right? So now we're on the compounding events there. So some strengths and weaknesses specific to these events in your, your given community, your scenario, your preparedness level. Location, right? We need to think about strengths and weaknesses. And this has been basically in every presentation so far, this slide. Because it's very important, you can't have this belief that, ah, everything is gold, everything is a strength. Because at some point, that dog that you think is awesome as a guard dog is gonna bark when it gets hungry or sees a squirrel, and now you've just alerted everybody to your presence, or at least the dog's presence, and maybe they go investigate. Right, so that strength can also be a weakness, can have moments of weakness. So location, population density, the infrastructure, and your distance to your destination, and we look at bug in versus bug out. The distance to your destination can be a strength or a weakness, depending on many factors. The network that you have, family, friends, neighbors, as well as your physical fitness level, right? So why is that under network? Because it's not just your physical fitness level. Because if they fall and twist an ankle, you're carrying their stuff. If you fall and twist an ankle, they're carrying your stuff, right? So it's more than just you. Physical assets. What do you have with you at your destination? And then consumable replenishment maybe along the way. It might take you longer to get where you're going than you had originally planned for. So I've got 24 hours worth of water. Okay, you're day three. You need more water. Where can you replenish that consumable? Vehicle, size, fuel range, and reliability. If it's too small, has a five gallon tank, and is on its last leg already, probably not something you want to depend on. Right? Or a Tesla. Or a Tesla, yeah. I mean, there's a storm of power outage. Yeah, how are you going to get somewhere? Great point. Seasonality. Is it hot or cold? More importantly, is it the rainy season? And your bug out location in the mountains just had a mudslide, but you don't know because you're here, right? Uh, is it snowed in? Are there so many leaves all over the road that your vehicle actually can't get up the hill? Has a fire just come through because it's, it's the hot season? We haven't had rain in four months. That kind of stuff. Seasonality actually comes into play more than you might think. Questions or anything to add to this? All right, action items. Meat and potatoes of this. So before an event, what's the most important thing you can do before an event? Prepare. Yeah, plan, establish a plan. What in the hell are we gonna do if, insert scenario here? You need a plan, primary, Alternate, contingency, and emergency. Fieldcraft survival. Anybody watch or read about fieldcraft survival at all? Watch them. Go home. There's your homework. Go home. Follow. Understand who they are, what their backgrounds are, and what they do. Like I said in, in many other seminars, don't just take my word for something. Don't just take any one person's word for something. Take it for what it is. Information. Might be good information or bad information that it understand how it applies to you, but then look at the other side of that coin. Okay, he's telling me I need a flashlight, but damn it, this guy's telling me I don't need a flashlight. There's gonna be some common ground in there, very likely, but ultimately you're gonna decide, well, for me, my scenario, I need a flashlight. My personal belief is everybody does. All right, so establish a plan, your primary plan. 
I'm going to go from point A to point B on road X. Great. Road X is out. Mudslide just came through. Now what? All right, alternate. We're not taking road X. We're actually going to take road XA, X alternate. All right, great. Well, X alternate, everybody else is taking that road. It's bumper to bumper. It's going to take you three times as long to get there. And there's no fuel along that route. All right, well, contingency plan. The contingency plan is <laughs> we're going to be driving not on roads. There's these trails that I know through the woods. And maybe the emergency is, look, everybody's yard is fair game. Just go. Right? Ensure everybody in your group, again, this is bigger than you, ensure everybody in your group knows the plan. Specifically, the every plan, right? Meet on a regular basis. That doesn't mean every week you jump on a freaking call or you have to go to the Starbucks. Well, God, Starbucks might be the worst place to do this. But go and talk, right? You don't have to do that every week. And when you do meet and talk, it doesn't have to be, all right, what preps did you do this month? It doesn't have to be that serious. It could be something as simple as, how are you? Did you get in a car accident recently? Are you injured? Are you healthy? Did you just come into a whole lot of money and I'm now your best friend? Whatever it is, right? Just meet on a regular basis. And that could be virtually, it could be in person, it could be on the phone, whatever. And then have copies of the plan. Printed are okay, but understand it might fall into hands of somebody who has malintent. Um, digital copies are great until the grid goes down and you can't access it. So understand what, what your scenario is, what you're planning for. Make sure everybody's got a copy of that plan, whether it's printed or digital or both or something. Make sure everybody knows what that plan is. And then meet regularly to discuss stuff. It can, it can be inadvertently discussing it. It doesn't have to be very blunt unless that's the type of group that you are. Keep open lines of communication between group members. This is, this is independent of meeting on a regular basis. Keep open lines of communication. Easy way to do that, group text. I'm sure everybody hates the group text. Or the, yeah. Ooh, I liked this message. And if you're an Android user, it just says liked and then the message. It's really annoying. But that's also a great way to stay in touch. Uh, social media platforms, email chains, Facebook groups, whatever it is. Or amateur radio. Host a net. Go on. Find a net. Learn about those people. Understand how they could be a benefit to your community as a whole. Maybe not directly. Maybe they're not a part of your group. But indirectly, they're a satellite group, a tactical information post, a forward operating base, whatever you want to call it. They can give you information 50 miles away that you can then use to change your plan or act on a plan. And then maintain current information for your area. Here's what I do. Wake up in the morning, next door app. What happened in my community overnight? Did anything happen, yay or nay? Cool. Next, go on to mainstream media. What if, whatever that is for you, mainstream media, it could be local broadcast, it could be national broadcast, whatever that is. And then you can also use radio. And I don't mean amateur radio, although you can use that, but AM, FM radio. That's still a thing, believe it or not. Your car still has it, it still works. It works great, in fact. Weather radio. We're all so accustomed to the app, the weather app on the phone. Oh, geez, it's gonna be such and such degrees outside today. Have you ever listened to a weather, a NOAA weather radio station? It tells you a lot of stuff. Stuff that you can listen to while you're brushing your teeth. Whatever it is, you don't have to have your phone in your hand. For those of us who are maybe kind of sick of all the electronic, digital, and the screen time that we have, we're trying to lessen our dependency on that stupid little thing in our pocket or purse. Turn on NOAA weather radio for your reports. Easy way to do it. Plus, then, if your phone ever goes down, you know what NOAA Weather Radio is, you know how to get to it, and you know what frequency it's on, if it's on an amateur radio or something like that. You can get to it, you can hear it, you know how far away it is, you know what, which station to turn to, etc. Anything else before an event? Anybody want to add anything? Looking good so far. All right, let's talk during the event. Continually gather information. 
as the CEO of Twitter will tell you, or Facebook, or Instagram, information is king. That's what makes me rich. I sell all your information to everybody, right? Information is king. Always keep on top of the situation through the gathering of information. That could be through the AM, FM radio, the ham radio, the web radio, mainstream media, whatever still works. Gather as much information as you can. Phone and FaceTime calls with people who are near or far. Check in on your family. Check in on those loved ones because that, that aunt that you have in Vermont is going to tell you what's going on in Vermont. And eventually, mainstream media is going to cover that if it meets the narrative, and therefore it's going to influence things possibly in your community. So if you know what's going on up there through those feelers, those satellite group members, so to speak, you can get information like that. And then lastly, don't forget to include not only where you are, but if you were to bug out, where you're going to go and everything in between those two places. Because the worst thing that you can do is say, oh crap, we need to leave this situation and go here, and then you end up in a worse situation, or even worse than that, you never make it there. Because something in between A and B didn't allow you to. So information, where you are, where you're going to be, everything in between, use everything at your disposal. Everything is information. Again, it's either good information or bad information, but you can kind of bet those against each other. Communicate early and often. As soon as a decision is made, whatever that decision is, whether it's to bug in, which is to actively stay in place, or to bug out, which is to leave in a hurry, you need to make sure that everybody in your group, whatever that group size is, it's in maybe it's an immediate family household, Maybe it's a neighborhood community. Maybe it's a prepper community of some kind. They need to know as soon as that decision has been made. Hey, we're on to plan A. All right, plan A, let's do it. Use whatever means of communication that you have previously identified as effective. Text message, group text. Uh, do you have like a billboard, online billboard or something somewhere? Maybe you've got a shared document on a cloud service. You don't send text, we're just going to upload it to the cloud service, make sure you check this, All right? Whatever that is. And then make sure you send any updates that are needed. Hey, I was just driving down 321, guess what? Tree across the road. Make sure nobody else takes 321. We're going to move on to plan B, route B, whatever that is, All right? So make sure you communicate that, and you got to be able to communicate that through the most effective way. Usually it's going to be cell phones, but don't become so dependent on that that it becomes your only form of communication. You might think, oh, well, my form of communication A is a phone call. Form of communication B is a text message that uses the same network. If you can't make a phone call, text message may go through unless they cut it off, and then that text message is never going to go through. Lastly, controversial one potentially, leave early. If the situation wasn't as bad as you thought, or ends up getting better, you can always come back. Always come back. If you wait too long to leave, you're going to be in the same as everyone else. And all you're going to be in that situation is a refugee stuck in a line of traffic sitting on a freeway somewhere. And guess what? That hurricane that you guys were all trying to leave and get out of the way of is just going to come through and take you out. It hits you while you're in your vehicle rather than while you're in your home. I don't know about you, but my house holds a lot more stuff and resources than my vehicle does. It's just bigger. Questions or comments on during an event? I can contest to uh, leaving early. You contest to it? No, I mean, I, 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 oh, I agree, actually. You agree um, the, uh, in, by 1999, my wife and I lived in Charleston, and Hurricane Floyd was coming. And they're like, leave. And we didn't. We waited merely maybe five, six hours. And our first instinct was to leave. And then we're like, nah, we waited six hours. And just those six hours, uh, we tried to drive to Athens, Georgia, which mm -hmm. is a three and a half, four hour drive. It took us 18 hours. Right. And we were still, and it turns out to be Floyd, you know, was nothing. It was huge and then it landed and just fed it out. But uh, we were on, I don't know if anyone's been to Charleston, you know, I 26. Yeah. I mean, it was like a disaster movie, and we were like, either we stay or we we, we go early. Now we've always thought, we you know, live here, so we're not 
much worried about hurricane, but when you were talking about stuck in traffic, it's like flashbacks. Yeah. It, I mean, it's, it sucked. It really, I mean, it was, it, mostly when it was all over, it was, you know, the I mean, 18 hours sitting on the road. Right. Uh, it was, it was horrible. And by so, the time you got to your destination, it was whatever turn it hit is already gone. Yeah, it was time to turn around, so. So, if you don't mind, I'll use your, your scenario here, and, and I'm going to pick on you a little bit. That's fine. I deserved it. What, obviously, 1999... <laughs> 22 years ago, sorry, uh, <laughs> I felt just as bad when I said it, don't worry. It was a different world. Phones weren't the same, but did you have a normal weather radio? Did you understand what that was, or were you just relying on broadcast news? Right, so if you have that ability, for instance, if anybody's interested, go out, turn the weather radio on in your car when you leave. What you're going to hear, you can turn it on your phone, more likely. What you're going to hear is a week's worth of, of information. So right now they're telling up, it's, it's Thursday currently, the web, no weather radio is giving you through Wednesday. They give you two days of this is the temperature, this is what it's gonna be, here's your overnight high and low, all that stuff, as well as wind speed and wind direction. After two days, it then just gives you high and low temperature and the uh, if it's going to rain, what that percent of chance is. So it might say, hey, it's going to be partly sunny on Sunday and a high in the mid-50s. On Sunday night, it's going to be whatever that is, right? So it'll give you a week out, that general thing. So you, in theory, could have known potentially a week ahead of time that it was coming. So you could have had a chance to get out. Obviously, everybody's situation is different. It being 1999, it was a different time. Uh, we didn't have the same technology we did, which means we didn't have the same weather predictability, that kind of thing. It's different. But don't just rely on that one source. Gather information from everywhere. Thank you for sharing. Well, the good news is that actually, I think it was my first step in being more aware, preparing that kind this of thing. This is never going to happen again. Amen. Yeah. Of course, we moved. That, that really helped the hurricane thing. Right. Uh, but just, in, just like anything now. Yeah. It's, you know. So that brings into another point, but we talk about seasonality, but as part of your location, it's more about, okay, in my location, what is the season, you know, by season, what do I need to look out for? All right, well, hey, in the spring, it rains like a freaking dog here, right? It just constantly rain. In the summer months, really hot, really humid, thunderstorm for about 30 minutes every day, right when you're supposed to drive home, and then it's nice again. And then in the winter time, we get snow usually between mid-January and mid-February. Somewhere in there, we'll get one snowstorm. It won't last very long, it'll be gone. But I won't be able to buy bread and eggs from mid-January to mid-February because everybody's gonna be stocking up on that. So understanding seasonality and what that might look like in your location is also a big thing. Hot summers in Vermont, cold winters, a lot of snow. All right, so some special considerations. We're still talking during the event. If you don't have a pre-planned destination and you don't have, for your route, your supplies, your food, your fuel, all that stuff, and a pace plan for every single one of those categories, you are nothing more than a refugee. Oh shit, honey, let's leave. Where the hell are you going? You better have a plan, because just leaving, not a plan. Are you gonna live out of your car? Are you gonna hope that every hotel or motel you drive by has vacancy? And oh, by the way, can take a credit card or is not going to charge you seven times the normal nightly rate just because they can to take advantage of the situation. You need to have a plan for all of those categories. If you run out of fuel, what are you gonna do? If you run out of supplies, where are you gonna replenish? The road that you're on, can you resupply along that route anywhere? How long to get there? All of that stuff. If you don't have that, you're nothing more than a refugee. If your bug out location is too far away, you may never make it. It's just the reality. Get at, by the time you got to Athens, hurricane's already done and gone. You never made it there before you needed to. However, if your bug out location is too close, it may be dealing with the same stuff you're trying to leave. So you gotta find that Goldilocks zone. How far is too far? Realistically, given your location, the infrastructure, the road network, your population density, all that kind of stuff, the level of preparedness as a whole in your community. People in Whitefish, Montana, 
probably a lot more prepared than people in New York City. Just throwing it out there. How far is too far? How close is too close? Because if your bug out location is your neighbor's house, they deal with the same shit you want. Unless it's a house fire. Now, depending on the event type and severity, you may come across checkpoints along your route, and they may not be military or law enforcement in nature. You wait too long, and it gets too bad, somebody's going to try to take your stuff. It sounds horrible. Standing up here, I'm like, holy crap. I would hate to think what would happen. You know, put myself in that situation. I have my family in the car, and we come across a checkpoint that is not a military checkpoint. Somebody's parked a couple cars in the road, and, uh, and they're here to take my stuff. What do you do in that scenario? Well, how about we avoid that scenario altogether and go back to what we talked about, which is leave early, because you can always come back. If you make the choice to leave, leave. If you actively make the choice to stay, make it, make it a good one, right? Stay, wholehearted, no wishy-washy in or out. Inaction is worse than action. It's just how it is. Any other special considerations? It's a heavy one, man. Real heavy. Quiet group tonight. All right, after the event, we can all breathe a sigh of relief. We've made it. We can see the slide, therefore we've made it, right? Group welfare checks. You all very likely don't live in the same house or same neighborhood. Check in on these people. What you don't want is two days later going, you know, shit, I haven't heard from Sharon. Well, Sharon and her family got in an accident on the way home and they bled out on the side of the road because you didn't call back and check for help. Took them two days, but they eventually bled out and died. Group welfare checks are extremely important. Hey, we got home, but man, you know, little Timmy, he stepped on this weird thing and now his foot's twice the size it normally was. Well, how about we go to the hospital? You know, stuff like that. Simple group welfare checks. It's, it's such a morale lift, but also it helps with group cohesion. And quite frankly, if, if people in your group are your friends, you should want to check on them anyway. And if you don't, then that's some other introspective that you might want to do. Who are you as a person? What does this person need to you? You care about them enough to put them in your group. Think about that. Supplies check. <laughs> Make sure nothing fell off the truck. You're bumping down a trail in the middle of the woods, and there goes a fuel canister. And you don't realize that until you're like, oh, I got 10 more gallons of fuel, and you don't. Supplies check. Make sure nothing fell off the truck. truck. And then also, very likely, you used something replenish those supplies. Rotate them while you do it, and then ask yourself, did I, this, this $40 thing that I bought that was supposed to be the next best thing since sliced bread, have I used that in three years? Does it make sense now that things have evolved? Do I need to still keep it? Can I sell it and make room for something else? Supplies restock, right? Kind of just what we talked about. You use stuff, so re replenish it, rotate it, get rid of what you don't need. And then an after action uh, group debrief. Talk about what worked. Talk about what didn't work. Talk about ways you can make it more efficient. And don't hold back. If these people are in the group of, uh, if this group is consisted of people you care about, they're family to you, basically then you need to be able to have open and honest communication with them. Hey, listen, your cooking fucking sucked. It was burnt every night. I didn't want to eat it. Therefore, I felt tired the next day. We need either different cooking utensils or we need a new chef, damn it. Yeah, it's going to suck. It may not say it like that, but, but be nice about it. But, but be honest about it. Hey, the nutrition was lacking. I felt tired constantly because the food was nothing that I wanted to eat. Therefore, I was hungry the whole time, which made me grumpy and agitated. And nobody wanted to deal with me. You weren't hungry enough. <laughs> you weren't hungry enough. Yeah. So have that open and honest communication with these people. Because I would much rather have a very tough communication, but identify something and then come out the other side stronger and, and better as a group than letting it fester and letting it cost somebody their health or safety. 
if I'm doing something wrong, I expect members of my group to step up and tell me I'm doing something wrong or I'm doing something the wrong way because I don't want that on my conscience. Something that I did directly impacted the health or it negatively impacted the health or safety of another group. That would drive me bonkers. Wouldn't be able to live this. It'd be tough. That's extremely important. What else does anybody have to add to this after action stuff? After the event? I'm going to put back for toilet paper. Yes, yes. <laughs> I've got one that I don't have on here, but I think it's something we would hopefully all do anyway. And that is help your neighbors rebuild, repair, clean up, and use that opportunity. Don't waste a good tragedy, right? Isn't that what the certain folks in our government say? Don't waste a good tragedy. Help them and help them understand that they need to be more prepared moving forward. Hey, this hurricane that rolled through, you know that tree knocked down, took out your fence? and you were worried about that, or it slapped the back of your house, popped your windows out, and you had no wood to board up the window, so you got soaked and wet, it ruined your walls, now all this insurance stuff, you're gonna have to make time for that. Oh, and your AC now is back on, but it's not working. Have that conversation with them after the fact, while you're helping them. Nobody, nobody likes the person standing on the side going, yeah, well, you know, that sucked, drinking a beer while they're doing all the hard work. That's called government labor. I've seen the people working on the side of the road. There's one guy digging a hole and the rest of them are watching. Don't be that person. Step in and help. It's all about community, but use that opportunity to help them understand where they could have done something different to more positively have impacted their scenario or their time during that scenario. What else? All right. So. That was a quick one. I don't even know that we're at an hour yet. We've got 40 minutes. A quick summary, quick recap, right? So first and foremost, bug out is to actively leave and in a hurry. Bug in is to actively stay. Both of those things are a choice that was made, not inaction or a lack of choice. Well, I didn't know what I wanted to do, and I'm just stuck here. It's the worst thing you can do, because very likely you're not prepared for that. Initial events may be violent or nonviolent, but any compounding event is very likely to be violent in nature. So while you might be preparing for a hurricane, understand that it may come down to civil unrest over time. Develop a plan and have a case plan for each category of things within that plan. So communications, communication, cell phone, ham radio, AMFM radio, whatever it is. Have a case plan for each category. Ensure everyone in your group knows the plan and meets regularly to review or revise it. Just because you wrote it down once doesn't mean that's how it's going to work every time. Hey, this is our plan and all of the contingencies. Great. Have you tried it? Okay. Always be gathering information for your location, i.e. where you are, where you want to be, your destination, and everything in between. And you don't want to leave what you think is bad only to get somewhere else where it's worse. Where you could have just stayed, you would have been better off staying at home. Find that Goldilocks location. Not too far that you can't get there, but not so close that it's going to be dealing with the same stuff. Inspect, rotate, replenish, and critique your supplies. Ideally, before an event happens, right? You want to make sure you've got the freshest, best stuff that you're actually going to use. That latter part being the most important. You could have the coolest thing in the world, beautiful, brand new Tesla. No battery power. Well, I think you're going to good. Whatever it is. Uh, and then practice dry runs on a regular basis, if you can. And I don't mean like, all right, I've seen well, doomsday preppers. I've seen doomsday preppers. We all pile in a school bus, we back up, we load the so bitch up, we're out here in an hour. Go. Not that. I mean, it could be that if you wanted to. But realistically, it's more just like, hey, let's go on a family drive today. We're going to leave the house no later than whatever, which, at least for me, because I hold my own family up, it's usually about 15 minutes after whatever I say. We're going to leave, and then I'm going to start a clock. And realistically, I'm not going to drive like an idiot. 
realistically, how long is it going to get me to go from point A to point B? What is that? Time trial, so to speak. And then you've got to figure, OK, everybody else is on the road. I could probably add whatever that time was times about three or four, realistically. And whatever my fuel economy was, cut it down to about a quarter of that. So you've got to be able to say, hey, i got 30 miles to the gallon on the highway. <laughs> Not in Atlanta, you don't. I've been on the highway in Atlanta. You don't go anywhere. Not between three and seven anyway, as you stop. So whatever that fuel economy is, you think, plan for it. Final questions or comments? Now's the time to ask. Let me go into the chat. Let's get in the chat. You didn't talk too much about the bugging in part. I didn't talk much about bugging in. Bugging in is extremely personal because everybody might have a different bug in strategy. There's Bug in, which basically is shelter in place, right? But then there's bunker in, which is a hardened location that you could actively defend, right? So like a bunker in, or quite frankly, a bunker. Yeah, I bought a home in the 50s, it's got this hole in the floor of the basement. There's a little pool pod underneath, whatever that is. Mostly, shelter in place is going to look like your everyday life just without leaving the house. In most situations, so like we've been doing for the last year. sort of like what we've been doing for the last year, exactly, yeah. and we will very likely do for much more time in the future. But yeah, I mean, it, it's one of those things that to bug in, you very likely have all the supplies you have already. They're right there. They're at your domicile, whatever that is, apartment, house, shed in the woods, whatever that is. Yeah, but. It's not going to look so different, very likely, than your normal life until the utilities go out. In which case, then it's like, okay, well, how? What's an alternative way for me to cook my food? I've got this beautiful electric oven, but I have no electricity. Do I have a propane backup? Do I have a fire pit out back? Whatever that looks like. So while sheltering in place is very likely going to look like your everyday life, at least what we know it's our everyday life now, you've got to plan for those. You know, a pace plan for things like cooking, uh, bathing, getting rid of waste products, both biological and non biological, stuff like that. Those are things you have to think about. Yeah. Well, to me, the biggest drawback is you know, I can stash a whole bunch of stuff in the house. If I have to put it in the car, you know, I put it down. Yeah, yeah it, it, it's less, and also it's going to very likely take you a long time to do it. And remember the time element of bug out, it, it's hastily, right? So, I mean, realistically, how quickly could you do it? Based on the scenario that you're thinking of. Now, again, if we're talking hurricane, very likely you have hours to days to prepare. But if we get to something down here like riots, you might have minutes, right? And that might be five minutes, it might be 50 minutes, 120 minutes, whatever that is. So yeah, I mean, you gotta figure out realistically what are you preparing for, how can your supplies aid you, and then realistically if you need it to bug out, what does that look like? How can you effectively do it and efficiently do it? Okay. What else? Any other questions, comments, thoughts, additions? Stories? Anybody want to share a story? Well, and I tell you, just since I'm a little older than most, I think about this now quite a bit differently than I would have 20 years ago, just from a physical standpoint of what you could do or how far you could walk or how far you could carry stuff. Like, just even say, load the car. Extremely good point. You, you as a person change over time, whether that be I twisted my ankle or it's been 20 years. You know, I'm, I'm different. I've had three surgeries since then, whatever it is. Yeah, I mean, that, you, you bring up a good point. Your plan now that you make will have to evolve as children get older, as you get a pet or something like that. I mean, that's something we didn't even talk about in this is pets. We've talked about it in some previous ones. 
Um, but yeah, I mean, if you've got a dog, you're gonna care, carry dog food, or unless you're gonna give up your food, right? So yeah, that plan's gonna have to change with every change in your life, whether that's age, time, if you buy a new house, if you have build a new supply, maybe you build a bunker in the backyard. You might be more inclined to bunker in than you would be to bug out. Yeah, it's a great point. Anybody else have anything? Real talking group tonight. <laughs> So I'll leave you with this. We've got one more seminar on the books next month. Uh, we're talking about strategic gear considerations. Intentionally vague, because gear can come in many different forms. But I'll tell you, we will be talking about tactical gear as it relates to offensive and defensive protection, as well as tactical in the mindset of information gathering, um, signaling, things like that. We're going to be talking about strategic gear considerations and how you might set some stuff up to help you if it were if it were just to break down. And let's say you're going to bug out. You got to go from point A to point B, and you don't know. You've got very little information, updated information between those points along that route. And you don't know if you might come across that roadblock or not. Um, we're going to be talking about gear considerations, everything that plays into that. Sounds expensive. It can be very expensive. Great. I know that you're not very. He's not letting me come. <laughs> you can stream it. That's the best part. You don't have to come. You can always watch it later, too. Thanks, Toby. Yeah, what was that thing again? I can write it down. I always go home with a list. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Keep in mind, you can always go back and watch the streams of the previous ones. I'll tell you, the first two, they didn't come out near as good as I would have liked. Um, the first one's more of a podcast, because it's kind of audio only. The second one kind of jumps around, um, but you can still get the information out of it. But the other ones, ways you're making your home a target, the effective kit, and uh, setting your vehicle up basically for success, those are decent quality. You can hear things, you can hear me talk, you can hear the group talk. So. I would encourage you to go back and rewatch them in a year's time. To his point, that plan might change. You might have a different vehicle. You might have different vehicle capabilities. Maybe you can go further. Maybe you can't go as far. Maybe you can carry more stuff. Maybe you can carry less. Maybe the reliability of that vehicle has changed. Maybe the vehicle has what the reliability has. Everything can change. Any closing comments, thoughts, questions? I, you look, you're, you're eager. Yeah. <laughs> no, we're just laughing. Because you said things can change. I said, yeah, we got more dogs. <laughs> got more dogs. Yeah, more dogs. Yeah, that's absolutely. Eat dogs, if you have to. Cool. Ah. Well, thank you for coming by tonight. I said about an hour. We're ending even earlier than that, about 50 minutes. So, yeah, take it with you. If you have questions, feel free to reach out. I'm happy to answer them and help. I mean, like we talk about, preparedness is a community thing. That's why I'm doing what I'm doing. I might not be the smartest person in the room. In fact, I can guarantee that I'm not. But I'm kind of the only one right now that I see stepping up to do this, at least here in this community. So if you know of somebody else doing it, please pass that along. I'd love to sit and listen to what they have to say, too. And go home and talk to your neighbors and get them involved. Get your group involved. Start thinking about what that group looks like. And then meet on a regular basis and communicate. Start a group text. Go buy something in bulk. Be good. Thank you for coming. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, bullets and bullets. <laughs> oh, you came.